Hello and welcome to my studio. I'm Jesse, and this is the Knit Up and Die podcast, episode 85, Finding a Rhythm. As always, I'm going to start out with my whole big list of thank yous. I appreciate you guys so much, and the messages I get from you all week long uh, make it worth doing so much so. Special thanks go out to all of my subscribers, new and ongoing. I love you guys. What you see here is all about you. Feel free to send me messages about what you want to see, what you want to hear discussed, what you'd like demonstrated. I am all about making it work for you. Special love and thanks go out to Diana from Down Under. Hello. Uh, Barbara, Faye, Julie, Janelle, Erica, Adriana, Wayne, Sonia, Patricia, Lisa Lette, Cappy, Kath, Benty, Christy, Nietzsche, Charlotte, Chris, Roseanne, Linda, Marie, Eve, David, Donna, Betty Ann, Scott and John, Kate, Janet, and Terry at Unwound, Monica, Bex, Carolyn, Nancy, and Rachel. Much love goes out to my Zoom family. I haven't seen you guys in so long. I keep trying to make time and it just keeps not working. That's going to change. Robert, Roz, Paula, Brian, Jen, Elizabeth, Nicole, M. Nicole, B., Katie, Shirley, Tracy, and George Ann. I love you guys. I'll see you soon. A warm hello and thank you goes out to all of my patrons who honor me. So, finding a rhythm. Well, as you well know, there have been a lot of changes in my life. One of which was that my shoulder injury flared back up again. It's better. <laughs> it's better. Um, I actually haven't even had to take in a leave now for two or three days, and before that it had been a couple days as well. Um, the trick is, of course, to make a doctor's appointment. It's just like when your car starts making a horrible noise, you have to finally get it into the mechanic, and you cannot make it make that noise again for the mechanic. Same thing for the doctor. Not entirely true. Uh, it did feel better the day that I went in to see the doctor. I had skipped my leave and I even did like some frantic knitting, stress knitting in my car to try and flare it up a little bit so that when I went into the appointment I would be able to say, it hurts right there. Um, my doctor, I love him. He's fantastic. He uh, reminded me that I'm not 20 anymore. I, I do have great appreciation for him. He has a sense of humor, and thusly when I told him, wow, you're observant, he had the decency to laugh. Um, I have tendonitis of the shoulder. That's the way that goes. Uh, there's nothing that's going to fix that shy of being kind to myself. So now I have a nice painful reminder that I need to be good to myself. Um, I, we were able to do a uh, steroid injection into the shoulder right there in the office. Bang! He came back with a big old needle and a sneaky grin on his face and jabbed me one. Um, it's better. I Funny thing with those steroid injections, you aren't sure that it's working. You just know that you're not in pain anymore, so I guess that means it's working. It. it I, I haven't felt a difference. I just am not in pain. So we're going to call that a difference and call that a good thing. Um, that should last me four to six weeks, in which time if I am kind to myself and if I do my exercises, theoretically I'm going to heal and by the time the steroid has worn off, I should be in good shape and it shouldn't be bothering me again. So, the trick is to fill that four to six week gap with the right things. And that is where finding a rhythm comes from. I need to de-stress and get myself into a routine that allows knitting on a limited basis, that allows dyeing on a limited basis, that allows exercise, uh, enforces exercise. We're going to use those words <laughs> instead. I, I can be allowed to exercise and I can sit on my sofa just fine. I'm really good at that. Um, so it just 
trying to create a new habit is what's going to happen here. And part of that new habit is healing. So with, with this, yeah, I got this goal in mind. Of course, there are new stressors and there are new changes to my world. Um, I had talked about we had a new friend. Uh, you saw pictures online of our uh, adopted dog. Quite unfortunately, yesterday we needed to take her back to the adoption facility. We are pretty devastated about the whole thing. Um, we, we really liked Gracie. She was very responsive to us. She fit in beautifully in the household. Uh, she was learning routines beautifully. She, she was a joy to have. She was a very happy little dog and Rudy liked her. We, we all liked her. We all got along and it looked like, it looked like we had family. Um, quite unfortunately, however, once she settled into our household and she started to catch her own rhythm and get used to the way we work and everything, she also um, discovered the chickens and her, her inner predatory prey drive. Uh, we had an incident, quite unfortunately, Friday. We came home from work and discovered that she had done significant damage to a very, very well-fortified uh, chicken coop and had caused a mortal injury to one of our birds. Um, sadly, it, it's... there. I have a really dark sense of humor. I try to um, try to be forgiving of my sense of humor. I, if I don't laugh at these things, I will curl up in a corner and I will cry. The chicken that was mortally wounded happened to be our other dog's girlfriend. Rudy had a thing for this bird. They were very friendly. She used to rub up against the the chicken wire and flirt with him and coo at him and he would go down there and he would lay against the coop and he would stare at her and he liked to play with her and come out and startle her and he kind of yeah nothing aggressive nothing predatory very much he he had a thing for the chicken Gracie attacked that particular bird um so the love triangle has apparently been resolved <laughs> And uh, Gracie is going to go and find another home. And we have been very careful with the adoption facility to pass on the information about what she knew, what her talents were, what her skill set was, um, her behavior around small animals, obviously her, her prey issues with chickens. And I have every confidence that that particular adoption facility is no kill shelter and they are amazing. We've had Rudy was from there. He was a fantastic placement. Um, we, we have every confidence that they will find a new home for Gracie that will be better suited. Uh, we honestly didn't take the chickens into consideration, which was probably foolhardy, uh, just because we've had multiple dogs now that it was never an issue. Uh, my dog Stinky didn't care about the chickens. He thought they were lovely. Chica, she didn't mind them at all. She, in fact, really enjoyed that they attracted mice and it gave her something else to chase. Uh, Haley never had any problem with the chickens. She could have cared less. You know, the, the mice were nice, but she really didn't care about the birds. Rudy, I mean, he's he's got a thing for hens. <laughs> has more romantic inclinations towards our hands. Um, and, and he actually has, uh, he's demonstrated some um, depression at, at losing both Haley and Chico over the past couple months, and he's lonely. But he's actually demonstrating some depression over losing Flo. Um, so it's, it's, he's really, he's kind of in a tough spot right now where he's lost Chica, he's lost Haley, he's lost his favorite hen, and now his new friend Gracie is no longer in the household, and he's kind of clingy, <laughs> kind of clingy. Um, we're going to take a time out for a couple weeks and repair the coop. That, that's been done. We did that today. 
and repair our hearts and souls a little bit and then we're going to try again and uh, see what we could do with another adoption. We're supporting our local animal shelter. <laughs> um, it, it's been stressful. It's been trying. The, unfortunately, you know, this incident just happened on Friday, two days ago. I'm still kind of gobsmacked. I'm still kind of stressed. We're angry and heartbroken and so it, it's it's going to be part of finding a new rhythm and the most current new rhythm is going to be not only will I be doing my yoga exercises but I'm also going to be adding walking with Rudy. Um, we have a large yard and they get all the exercise they need when there's a couple of dogs around. He doesn't get as much exercise when he's the only dog. He has a tendency to turn into kind of a sofa slug and he we have a tendency to over treat him uh, when he's depressed. You know, we, we want our dog to be happy. And so we're going to change that mindset and over treating is going to turn into same level of treating you were getting plus we're going to go for walks and that should help tone the mom as well as the pup. And perhaps we'll get dad out there as well and everybody will get moving. New rhythms, new rhythms. So, what else has been going on? I've been knitting. Little bits, little bits. Um, part of finding this new rhythm is that I'm going to be setting some new limits on myself. Um, did I just say finding this new limit? Finding this new rhythm. I'm finding new limits. There we go. Um, so, I'm, I'm trying to really pace myself with my knitting and not do so much binge work. Not that I had a lot of time to binge, but when I did have time, that's what I did. I binged. So I'm trying to break it up a little bit. And this is a good thing on many, 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 many levels. Not only is it going to give me the ability to heal that shoulder, but it's going to give me a different zen about my knitting. I'm going to get back to my intentional knitting. I talked about this you know, a year, a year and a half, two years ago, where you're thinking very actively, where you're, you're actively present in the moment while you're knitting. I will be taking stock of my body language, of my posture, to make sure that I'm opening that shoulder up, that I'm in a relaxed posture, and I'm going to really be enjoying the sensory again. Not just, I'm knitting, I'm getting it done, but very much I love this color, I love this yarn, I love the hand of the yarn, my posture is good, I'm relaxed, this is peace time, and I'm really going to be imparting much more positive psychometry back into my knitting. If you've never heard about this before, it's something I touched on before, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about it. Psychometry is the belief, the sci-fi, science, the, the etheric study of imparting energy, whether it's negative energy or positive energy, onto an inanimate object. Think of it very much like this. When you're making a record, you have a clay disc. The original records. We're going back in time, folks. That clay disc, you then had a stylus for, and your vibrations, the speech that was being recorded, the ambient sound that was being recorded, was being imparted onto this clay disc. The vibrations are actually being cut into the disc. The same thing happens without causing an actual cut in to all the inanimate objects around us where the vibrations that we are putting out, whether it is the warmth of a hug, the shattering of a shriek, the positive energy, the negative energy, whatever is coming off of you, radiating off of you, is being imparted onto all the objects around you, very much like you're cutting a record. You experience this every day. You see it every day. Um, you, you sense it on a sub-level, subconscious level, or sometimes it just strikes you. These things are most often active in your mind when you are remembering somebody. 
um, people are most actively aware of psychometry usually when they are cleaning up behind a dead loved one. Um, if you go into their home and you pick up an object, as soon as you touch that object, that psychometry, all the energy of that is coming back at you. You're receiving it, you're feeling it. And it's at those times where we are emotionally vulnerable and open that we sense it most strongly. But certainly it's around us every day. You have it in your comfort zone. When I come into my studio, this is the place where I create and I think and I'm happy. And I created this entire environment for me. So it's very, very personal to begin with. But because all of that energy has been imparted in here, because this is my private space to sit down and talk to you folks, and I have joy from that, because this is my favorite chair and I get to sit here and knit, because that is the desk that I design at and I have creative energy flowing into that computer and back out through my patterns. When I walk in here, the whole air, the whole energy of all that strikes me and I'm immediately ready to be a part of that environment. The same thing happens when you go into your cubicle at work, if you're so gifted, where whatever you do at that desk, whether it is customer service or it is problem solving or you're putting fires out or you're doing math or you're focusing on design work, as soon as you sit down there, that attitude, that energy comes back on you. So you have to be careful about creating your environments because you get what you give. And if you're putting out, yuck, I don't want to be here, you're putting that on the walls and the next time you come back in there, those walls are going to reflect that all right back at you and go, yuck, we don't want you here either. Um, I, I believe strongly in psychometry. I experience psychometry all the time. Um, obviously here in my environment, I talk about it, but you get it off of knitting and you get it off of hand felt gifts. Uh, as well. And that's a big part of why I wanted to do the ornament exchange this year was not only was everybody going to receive a collection of ornaments, but they were going to create these ornaments and their energies were going to be attached to it. And they make that gift that much warmer, better, happier, um, personal, personal. The handmade gifts are the best because whether you want to or not, you're imparting gift giving on that object and people receive that gift giving energy. Our intentions are so important and it's, it's the same science of the food tastes better because it was made with love. Hopefully you're following me with this. So um, by changing my rhythm and by doing this more intention knitting where I'm only going to be working, say, on a sock, I'm only going to work three to five rounds. I'm going to have much more focused knitting. I'm excited about that. I do want to get back to my intention knitting. I enjoy intention knitting. It's going to be healthy for me. It's really going to help me with my posture issues. It's going to help me with my fatigue issues, it's going to make what I knit that much more valuable. Also, it's going to allot me some more time to focus on other things, and that's part of why I'm excited about having some limited time with my knitting. By limiting my knitting, by not allowing myself to get on the hamster wheel where you just knit and knit and knit and knit and knit and five hours go away. I'm going to be doing a lot more of my design work, my blogging, and my dyeing. But I'm also going to be setting limits on those as well as to how much time I spend in front of the computer, how much time I spend in the kitchen with hot pots, and really just kind of try to get a nice, I don't want to say schedule because schedule sounds rigid, but a nice set of time allotments where I can go, okay, I'm prepared, I have an hour, I'm going to do this. And have it be mindful, have it be meaningful to me. Because what has been happening to me is I want to do all the things. I want to do all the things. And I don't limit myself. I don't ratchet myself back. And instead, I go at everything like a freight train and I wear myself down. 
it's stuff that I love. It's stuff that I want to do. But too much of a good thing is too much of a good thing and it becomes a bad thing. I can sit down in front of my computer and I can work on blogs and three hours are gone and all I've done is answered emails and caught up on things by limiting myself and saying, okay, we're going to do this for an hour. We're going to do this for an hour. We're going to do this for an hour. I'm actually going to be more productive. I'm going to be less likely to chase squirrels. I'm going to be more focused and more intentional in what I'm doing. It's a plan. <laughs> it's a plan. I, I'm excited about it. I am kind of, I, I am journaling out what my plan is and what I want to do. And I'm going to be keeping track of it to see if I can create these new habits and make them valuable for all of us, all of us. So knitting, like I said, I got a little bit of knitting done. I've been working on another pair of squircles. I'm addicted. General hog buffer, you are evil. Um, such a fun pattern. I've talked to you guys about it three or four million times before. I just love what this particular heel formula does. The idea, the concept is that you get a square and a circle. You're knitting a sock in the round, but we get this cool 90 degree turn. And this is particularly obvious with self patterning yarns like the yarn I'm using here, where all of a sudden it does this super cool 90 degree turn and it keeps all these stripes going fun directions for you. It's a clever pattern. It's easy. He has it written in such a way that it's a formula so you can adapt it to whatever cast on count you use, whatever size foot you have. Look at this heel. Look at what it does. Is that not going to be super cute in a pair of clogs all winter long? I just love it. I, I even bought another pair of clogs just so I have an excuse to wear my squircles. And I washed socks today. Holy cow! I so wow you're gonna know way too much about me uh, clearly I'm chatty today because I'm focused and today I'm doing a podcast and this is my designated time to do this I decided that it was time to do my socks I have a little bin that I keep with all the other laundry bins and hand knit socks get a couple of wearings before they make it to the bin and because you can wear them a couple times before they make it to the laundry bin uh, that laundry bin doesn't get washed often or regularly. I've had socks in there for, we're going to say, six months. Randomly. We'll, we'll pull that number. About six months. There's nothing wrong with that. They're just sitting in this nice bin. They're wool. They're perfectly content. They're just waiting for their next opportunity to be washed. So today I decided the bin was full. I'm running low on socks. I need to go through that bin anyway and say, look, this is worn. This one's felted. This one's got to go away and slim down the socks because it's been six months and some of them are not happy socks any longer. So I took all the socks and I put them through the wash system that I have for my hand knits. And lo and behold, Guess what I found lurking at the bottom of my sock bin? Remember my husband's hat that we couldn't find? John's original five hour hat was sitting in with my socks. Grr. <laughs> Never occurred to either of us to look there. And when I plucked the hat out and I went to my husband, I found your hat. He laughed. He said, well, it's about time you wash your socks. <laughs> I said, did you know it was in there? He's like, no. Like, Egh. anyway, so I washed all my socks. I have a lot of socks. Um, I have a lot of socks though that need a lot of help. And so I'm getting myself more socks. It was time for more socks. I love my hand knit socks. And I love this pattern. And I discovered in doing the laundry, in doing my hand knit socks, that I've actually knit this pattern like three times already. And I had forgotten some of the pairs that I had already knit. And I love those too. And I'm so excited that they're going to be back in the rotation. <laughs> it's, 
It's stupid how much joy I get from a pair of hand knit socks. I really just love them so much. There is so much pleasure to be taken from a pair of socks that fit your feet. And I, I don't know if everybody experiences this quite the same way that I have. I happen to have a good sized hoof and commercial socks are not they, they actually make them in multiple sizes. They actually make them in multiple sizes. It's very hard to find the larger size in women's socks. I suppose I could get online and I could order commercial socks in the larger size, but why would I? I can make my own that fit. I just had suffered for many, many, well, for multiple decades, we're going to say, with socks that did not fit well. And to have a collection of socks in colors and patterns and styles and designs that fit me, that I made, is so cool. It's so cool. If you have never knit a sock, please give it a try. They're, give it a try. They are... I, I think they're fun. I, I know some people think that they're monotonous. I think they're so much fun. You get to work on a little section of knitting and then you move on to a different different thing altogether. And as soon as you're tired of that, you move on to a different thing altogether. And the whole sock is that way. And if you love the yarn, that second sock is going to be just as much fun as the first. I, I don't always understand. I, I try to understand. I try to put on the shoes and I try to understand people who say that they they hate knitting socks because of second sock syndrome. It's like a roller coaster ride and I get to run around and go back through the inn again and do it again and I just, I maybe I'm weird, I enjoy it too much. Now, a sweater? I have second sock, uh, second sleeve syndrome, I think. If I can make it through the first sleeve, I just have to convince myself that it'll be faster to do the second sleeve because I know what to expect. And I force myself to pick that one up and get into it because I usually, by the time I get through the first sleeve, I am just done with that project. Maybe it's about duration, maybe it's about how long we work on things and we just fatigue on things rather than pressing on. Anywho, this has been worked on in literally sets of like five rounds at a time and I've made really, really good progress on it. A little bit on the drive into work, a little bit during my lunch, not the active crazy get it done that I was doing and I'm a lot happier with it. I feel really good about it. I will continue to snap pictures of my progress as I go. Those always get posted to Instagram. If you're following me on Instagram, you'll see what I'm doing and you'll be able to keep an eye on me uh, and let me know if I've gone, oh look, I just got three inches done. You can give me the uh-uh-uh, not what you're supposed to be doing. My how to eat an elephant blanket. I had done a couple squares just before last weekend when I podcast last. I was really excited about it, but my shoulder had flared up, so I haven't touched it. The barn dance shawl, ha, huh? good news. It's a good thing I have a list. I can't remember all of this. Um, barn dance shawl. My tech editor reached out to me. She is back to work part-time. She has her real job that she's been catching up with, uh, having healed from her, her accident and subsequent surgery. She got caught up at her real job and now she's back to her tech editing on the side and we are on deck. We are on deck. We're the next pattern for her to look at. So this should be coming up. I'm hoping, hoping to hear back from her by next weekend, at which point barn dance is going to start to move forward very, very quickly. Coffee bar. That is the other shawl that I was, uh, am, am designing. That is the worsted weight one. That one's been camping. I'm going to be getting back into that one very soon. I also have another pattern that I'm designing and I'm doing that design really as an exclusive Patreon project. I am blogging out the uh, design process as I go with that. Pop on over, take a look. If you are not already a patron, 
you might want to check that out and see if you can get exclusive access and follow me on that process as well. Dyeing. So I got some dyeing done this afternoon. I'm kind of excited about that. Sorry, it's really dry in here. Um, I have some new bases that I brought in. They're not technically new bases so much as they are new yardages of bases that I already have. I have brought in 50 gram skeins of my Tap Monkey. Very excited about that. That's going to be really cool for smaller projects or for doing um, socks where you're doing uh, contrasting heels and toes. We are going to have a new tier ha, 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 in the Patreon program that's going to include 50 gram skeins. So that's coming up for uh, December. We'll be watching for that. So. We have another drawing coming up beginning of November. The new tier will be coming in shortly after that, and you'll have the opportunity to sign up for that for the December. Um, I also got in some DK weight yarn that are minis. They're 20 gram minis. They're 54 yards a piece, and I'm starting to dye those up. Those are being dyed uh, primarily in semi-solids, for color work, for DK color work, and I, I'm looking forward to unveiling some of that. That's all in process. I also got a lot of dyeing done, not last weekend, but the weekend before. That is all on deck for a shop update, and I'm hoping, ha ha ha, let me see schedule wise, I think that I should be able to get some of it into the shop this afternoon, definitely during the week if I can't get it done today. It's all about my time slots. We're gonna, we're gonna aim. Um, gotta make sure that I get out and take a walk though. So we're, we're, we're jumping things around here. Also, uh, the ornament exchange, I talked to you about that briefly. I just sent an email out to everybody regarding that so you all have my address to ship to. We've had a few people drop out, just a couple. Injuries, time constraints, I get it. I'm with you. Boy, am I with you. Uh, if you are participating and things are starting to look tight and you're thinking, ah, I'm not going to be able to do all six ornaments, don't let that be a reason to drop out. That's why we have angels. If you can get three or four done, great. You're still in. Don't get depressed. Don't leave me on that. We have angels and we're all going to support each other on this and this ornament exchange is going to be great. Uh, we've got all kinds of fun extras coming in. We have beautiful, beautiful ornaments coming in from other people in the exchange, and I am so excited about this. Uh, if you have wild time and big designs and wish that you had gotten in on the ornament exchange, please pop open, pop open, pop over to DieMonkeyYarns.com. What we're asking for is six handmade ornaments, yarn fiber based, and a $7 participation fee, and you can be a part of the exchange as well. If you are ambitious and you can get it done in time, you are welcome to join us. I have all kinds of fun treats attached to that. I'm, I'm so excited about this ornament exchange, and I'm so glad I started it early. I originally started talking to you guys about this in the hottest days of the summer, but these things take time, and if you don't plan, you get to the last minute and you just don't have time for it. And with my shoulder injury, it's been kind of a struggle. I have got four of my ornaments done. I'm, I'm cheating. I'm looking at them. And I need to get two more done. And I need to make sure that it all fits in with my new rhythm of everything. So you're not alone. I understand. I have a big giveaway coming up. Um, I want to do a giveaway in time for the holidays and I'm pulling together some stuff and this is going to be a big prize pack. I have a project bag, I have yarns, I have a couple patterns, I have stitch markers, all kinds of goodies. Be on the lookout, be watching. I think we're going to have our formal announcement next podcast where I'll show off what's actually going to be the prize and what you need to do to qualify to win. That's everything I have for you guys. Um, no, it's not. 
I tell a lie. So I was dying earlier today and I was thinking about my dye process and my documentation of my dye process. And a couple things occurred to me that I didn't think I had talked to you guys about before. So I'm going to insert some footage here for you from my kitchen earlier today. Welcome to my kitchen. So I was doing a little bit of dyeing this morning and it occurred to me that there were certain aspects of how I document my recipes that I may not have conveyed to you in the past. And they're kind of important because they are the difference between replicating and not replicating. Ultimately, when you're dyeing yarn and you love your colorway, you want to be able to reproduce it. You want to be able to replicate it. So taking notes about how you dye the yarn is very, very important in that. And that's more than just what was my recipe. It's also about how did I apply the dye to my pot, to my pan, to my yarn if I'm hand painting. And, and there's kind of a, you have to be very self-aware. You have to pay attention to yourself and how you do things and what you're thinking at that time so that when you document that, you understand that language again later. For example, I'm making yarn right now for my patrons for the November yarn and I have a colorway that I've developed but it's not always the easiest colorway to reproduce. Part of the reason it's difficult to reproduce is because I'm doing a half wall pour with very little blending. I want the colors to kind of come up with each other and marry, but I want more subtle shades coming together rather than a hard line. To get that, I have to be very deliberate in how I apply my dye. First off, I have my yarn soaking in my solution. It's water, it's a cup of vinegar, and the yarn is on heat, so it's nice and warm and ready for that dye to take up immediately. I have my dyes all pre-mixed and ready to go so that once this is fully soaked in, I haven't squeezed it, I haven't pushed it down, I've put the yarn in on heat and let it absorb and fall under the surface on its own. These are things that I'm including in my notes. Soak on heat till fully submerged. Then when I'm doing my wall pour, my notes are very specific that I'm doing a very slow and deliberate wall pour so that the colors will stay pale in the center of the pan. I'm being very slow about it. I'm really taking my time putting the dye in so that the dye doesn't travel far. It stays pretty much right where I put it. It will still blend. It will still move around, but it's not flushing across the pan as I load it. One at a time, very slowly. Now mind you, this isn't always the case. For different effects, sometimes I will note strong center pour, fast. That means that I'm literally just dumping the dye into the pan so that the power of the dye, the power of the liquid carrier that it's in, goes down very quickly and flushes out to the sides and comes up and around. These are all just different techniques to get different effects. If I did a strong center pour with two colors in the middle of this pan, I would still see the two colors, but the yarn would look very different than the pour that I'm doing right now. I'm gonna grab the camera, I'm gonna show you what it looks like right now, and then I'm gonna show you the end result. Notice right now, the color is staying very, very to the sides against the walls where I put it. So we're over by the sink now and I have some yarn that I've already dyed up in the same colorway. You're going to notice very quickly when I pull this out of the sink that the color did not stay just on the sides where I put it. It did still bleed in, but it left some very interesting pale characteristics in the middle. Notice how you can still see roughly the wall pour. There's a section here that is just the brown that I put on one side and a section here that is just the navy that I put on the other. But they did still blend in and they left a lot of pale. 
where the colors are just barely glazing over the outside of the yarn and leaving some really interesting warmer hues. Had I done a strong center pour or I'd done a fast pour, these colors would have been much more solid, much more complete, and wouldn't have had these strations and lighter sections in them. We want this value, we want this interest for this particular colorway. That's why I documented how I did it so that I can repeat it. Processing notes aren't just about the pans. They're about tray dyeing as well. For example, this particular recipe reminds me to flip and repeat. However, this recipe also has a lot of creative license. This is one of my scribble recipes, and so it simply tells me to scribble the colors on. With scribbling, you're always going to get a variety. It's always going to be different. That's why we call it scribbling. If you're looking for something to be very exact, you're going to want to draw a diagram or be very specific about three stripes or two squiggles or three circles and really be sure that you document cleanly. Otherwise, let it be what it is. This particular technique, like I said, is scribble and it's supposed to cause a variegation. It's supposed to cause wild colors. Let it be what it's supposed to be. But document what you're doing. So what exactly am I including in my documentation? First off, I include the date. I want to know when I did it. If I lose my notes, I can always look back and see, yeah, I remember doing that in October. I generally have a name for my colorway. Um, we're going to do a fictional colorway here, so let's name it when we're done. I draw out the pans that I'm using. For this particular colorway, I'm going to say that I'll be using my roasting pans and that I'm working with two of them at a time. I draw out how I lay my skeins in the pans, and these are rough sketches, just something so that you can look back and understand it later. I notate how many skeins I have and what base I'm using. I notate what has been added to the pan. I notate how I'm going to set it. Then I notate out my recipes. Sometimes they're multi-process and I need to have multiple steps. This one's going to be one of those.
So I've notated my dye recipe as well as the action, what I'm doing with it. In this particular case, what I'm saying is that I'm going to pour one cup of this recipe in the end of each pan, tilt the die, tilt the pan so that the die bleeds toward the other end, and then I'm going to set it. Then I'm going to go on and do another step. So on the fly, I've created a new colorway. What I've done is I have created a recipe for each of the condiment bottles that I'm going to use, and I've notated that each of these recipes is going to be transferred to a condiment bottle, scribble applied, we're going to set it, we're going to flip it, and we're going to repeat it. This is how I document what's going on. This way, I know when I decide that I want to make more of this yarn, that I'm going to need two skeins per pan, that I'm going to put six cups of water in each pan and a cup of vinegar in each pan, that I'm going to set my oven at 225 degrees. I know that there's two stages, that I have to create one recipe, apply it to the yarn, and set it before I do the next stage. Then I'm going to create three more recipes, transfer them to the condiment bottles, scribble apply them, set the yarn again, that means make sure that the color is in there through heat application and time, then flip and repeat. Generally, I know that my set process takes 20 minutes. But certainly, if there's still dye floating around, you want to give it more time and make sure that when you flip it over, you're not disrupting and leaving a lot of loose dye around that's going to take up in the yarn and cause blurry results. So I have a teal, I have a chocolate, I have a violet color, so purples and teals and browns with a navy. I think I would call this grandmother's quilt. I notate the pattern name so I know how to label my yarns later. It's that easy. You don't need to do a lot of forms or creating spreadsheets. You can just use a simple notebook. Now, I really love these. This is the Friction uh, Pen Line by Pilot. I like to use pen. I find the pencil just gets kind of messy. Um, these are erasable. I love this. If I don't like how I notated something, I can erase it. That simple. So hopefully if you're a dyer, that information that I shared about how I document will help you. I it, Honestly, it doesn't take special forms. It doesn't take anything extra. Just document what you're doing and then you can make stuff that you can repeat. That's everything I have for you this week. I love you guys. I can't wait to see you next time. Please, if you're healing, take care of yourself. And if you're not healing, knit up a storm. Bye.